endureth forever. And we realize that since we've last met, men have had to answer the call of death, but God's been good to us, allowed us to stay on this side of life just a little while longer. And we realize and we recognize that God didn't have to do it, but we're sure thankful. We are grateful that God did. God is such an awesome God. He's good all the time. I said all the time. God is a good God. We're grateful to be able to assemble ourselves together today for the express purpose of worshiping God because God is worthy. He is worthy to be worshiped. Uh, we keep in mind Elder Davis, and we are thankful to God that God has blessed him to be able to leave the hospital and be able to return home, and we continue to lift him and Sister Davis up uh, in prayer. Let's continue to pray uh, for, for both of them that God would just continue to wrap them in his care and just watch over them. We love them. We appreciate them for the, uh, for the example, the great example that they are to this congregation and the great people that they are. We're just grateful for them. We're grateful to see Brother Merriweather uh, here as well. He had his stay there in the hospital. Grateful that God blessed him um, as well. It's good to see the Headleys. I'm telling you the truth. I, we almost had to put out an APB out on them. I had to go find them. We're just grateful. But she mentioned, though, before they left that they were going to be gone for a couple of weeks. Wanted them to know it's just so good to see you all, to lay eyes on you all. And we're praying also for Elder McMillan. He's out of town today. Sister Sarah Williams is out of town as well. She's going to be going all next week. So if y'all need something, don't call the church. Don't, don't call that church. No, don't call the church because chances are I'm not going to answer that phone. But I, but I still love you. I still love you. If you need me, call my cell phone, but don't call the church. Don't call the church. I'm, and don't come to the door. Don't come to the door. Don't. And, uh, but uh, I want y'all to think it had nothing to do with my love for you. I had nothing to do with my love for you, but I'm not going to answer that door. I'm not going to answer the door. But so just be mindful uh, of that. She'll be gone all, all next week. And so pray for her also. She's out of town. And us others, the Wins, um, brother and sister Wynn, let's pray for them. They were up in the Baltimore area last, last week. Let's continue to pray. Uh, for them. Appreciate everything that has um, preceded me. Appreciate Brother Greg for the wonderful hymns of Zion. We appreciate so much the prayer, Brother Falk, and we just appreciate everything so far. I got a song. Let, let's sing, y'all. Usually, it's been a long time. So I, I'm, I'm going to be talking about the offering today, so I need to sing something to make y'all uh, at least give you hopefully a little joy with, with the song. But let's, let's go back and get an old one. King Jesus will roll all burdens away. Y'all remember that one? All right, if not, just hum real loud, hum real loud. So Pound said, wait a minute. She said, I can't talk and sing. She said, every time you talk and start singing, you pitch the song too high. So I told her, she said, wait a minute. <laughs> 59, 58, no. When I should feel so sad, when does my heart feel so glad? Why does my soul feel so happy and gay when all around me burdens fall? Church, I'm not worried at all. For if I pray, King Jesus will roll all burdens away, all away, all away. King Jesus will roll all burdens away. If to him I pray, church, he'll open doors for me, doors I'm not able to see. And if I pray, King Jesus will roam. All burdens away, all away. 
church all away. King Jesus will roam all burdens away if to him I pray. Church, he'll open doors for me. Doors I'm not able to see. And if I pray, King Jesus will roll my burdens away. One more time, church. Well, all away. All away. King Jesus will roll all burdens away if to him I pray. Church, he'll open doors for me, doors I'm not able to see. And if I pray, King Jesus will roll, roll my burdens away. Amen. Amen. God bless y'all. God bless y'all. Come on. Come on. We're This is Focus Sunday, and once every quarter or so, we do a lesson just to encourage the congregation to let us know where we, where we are. And it just dawned on me, usually when we do this, Elder Davis would come before us and, and give us where we are. So I guess the next time, Lord's will, uh, we get here, we'll just have to double up um, on, on everything. You don't know anything about that, do you, um, Elder Smith? Okay. I wasn't sure whether, I th just thought about that, whether or not they gave the assignment to you. But usually, Elder Davis will come before us in, in regards to our, uh, where we are at this uh, particular juncture. Um, but so we'll just look forward then, Lord's will, about three months or so. Um, to just to let the congregation know uh, just where we are. We must sow in order, in order to reap. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 6, the Apostle Paul said, For this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Very interesting um, scripture. And so we talked about that this morning in our Sunday school, that giving um, is not paying. Uh, because we talked about that, that you and I could never repay God for what God has given to us. So giving is not paying. So what is, what, what is that we do? We are sowing. Uh, when you pay, uh, it's a debt we owe, but when you give, it's a seed that you sow. And so what we're doing, we are sowing. We are sowing um, a seed. Uh, we are sowing a uh, seed. And have you ever realized that what the Bible says about giving to God as Christians, we are called to be faithful stewards of that which God has entrusted us with. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 2, moreover, it is required of steward, stewards that they be found faithful. And so that's who we are. We are, you and I are nothing but stewards. We are stewards of that which belong, which belong to God, because everything belongs to God. I said everything belongs to God, yet God gives. God is his, and he gives. He gives that which is his. James reminds us in James 1, verse number 17, it tells us, that every good and every perfect gift uh, is from above. And it comes down from the Father of lights, of whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. Uh, that, that's the God that we serve. What is that verse saying? It says every good and every perfect gift is from, is from above. It comes down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. That's the God that we serve. Everything. You got to keep that in your mind. Everything belongs to God. And that's why the Bible said in Psalm 50 and verse number 10, it's as if the psalmist started looking at the cattle that was on top of the hill. And as if he started, our uh, brother C. Wright, like he started counting, he started counting the cattle. Uh, but it was so much. God had so many cattle until he started counting the hills on which the cattle uh, were standing. 
And so the Bible said, God speaks and says, for every beast of the forest, they're mine. And then he said, the cattle upon a thousand hills, they're mine. Watch this. Now, the cattle on the hill belong to God. The hill belongs to God. But then in Haggai chapter 2, verse number 8, the Bible said, God said, the silver is mine and the gold is mine. Let's review. The cattle on the hill belongs to God. The hill belongs to God. The silver and the gold in the hill, they are God's as well. Matter of fact, the Bible said in Psalms 24 and verse number 1, the Bible concludes and says, not only that, but the earth is the Lord's and the fullness, the fullness thereof. So therefore, everything belong to God. We're just nothing more than stewards. We're stewards, and as one sure way of acknowledging ownership, uh, my friend, in regards to our giving. It's not ours. Giving, recognize that nothing is actually ours. And we talked about that this morning in Sunday school, that we came here broke, and we're going to leave here broke. Because the Bible said we came, Paul told Timothy, we came with nothing, and then when you die, you leave. Isn't that amazing? All the stuff you can acquire, all the degrees, all of the monies you may have, when you die, you can't take nothing with you. And that's just fascinating to me that we came here with nothing, and when we leave here, we're going to have nothing. But giving recognize that nothing is actually ours. Well, some I might say, well, uh, Brother Pounds, and I, I mentioned this in Sunday school, now I want to address this. Some folks say, well, Brother Pounds, I want to give to God and not man. And, and so, so why give my money to church? Because I, I want to give to God. I thought that was a very interesting um, thing, so I, I, I delved into that. First of all, God does not live physically on, on earth. God, God does not physically live here. Yeah, this is not his home. But he's called the church, Christians, his ambassadors um, here um, on, on earth. The church of Christ is his ambassadors. And then when you read the Bible in the book of Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 8, in Hebrews 7 and verse number 8, listen to what the Bible says. And the Bible says, and here, and it starts off by talking about Melchizedek and Abraham. Um, and I'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, but the Bible says, as it's, it talks about the, the giving of tithes, it's interesting when you read Hebrews 7 and verse number 8, where the Bible says, and here on earth, he says, here men that die, they receive tithes. Men, men who are here, they receive the tithe. But the Bible says, but there in heaven, that he receiveth them. Uh, the Bible says, of whom it is witness that liveth forever. What is that scripture telling us? This verse teaches us that God receives man's offering in heaven, even though it was given here on earth. Because the Bible says, and here men that will die receive the tithe. But there in heaven, God, the Lord receiveth them, of whom it is witness that God, in fact, does, does live. And so we got to understand that God recognizes and God receives our giving, and it's not based upon man. So, therefore, the question becomes, what shall I give um, to God? Because, first of all, we need to recognize that giving is an act of worship. When we come together, there are five expressions of worship. An expression, now remember now, God is love, and whatever we express toward God, it must be in line with the nature of God. And so whatever we do, it has to be out of love. Whatever the preaching, it has to be for love of God. When it comes down uh, to our singing, the things we ought to be singing about, they ought to remind us of the love of God. They ought to remind us how awesome God is. They ought to give us reason uh, to think about the goodness um, of the Lord. When we pray, we're praying to God because of the fact that we, we want to talk to him. We love him. And then not only that, uh, my friend, when we when we give, giving shows our love for God. Giving is based upon love. Matter of fact, you measure love. Uh, is love, my friend, that is measured by the amount of sacrifice um, that we do. And then when we give, it ought to be a sacrificial giving. We give. We give um, to God. And the Bible is plain where it tells us in regards to this, you measure love by sacrifice in John 3 and verse number 16. For God so Love the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoso believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Go through that again. For God so loved the cosmos. God so loved the world that he did what he gave. What did God give? What did God sacrifice to show us how much he loved us? God loved us so much 
he gave his son. That's the love that God has for us. So giving is an act of worship. We commune. Commune shows because all the four I mentioned, the expressions of worship, they express our love for God. But thank God when we get down to communion, this is God's way of showing his love for us. God said, I love you so much until I gave my son. And it was that same blood that was shed, the same blood that washed you from, from your sins. And so giving, brothers and sisters and visitors and friends, is an act of worship. And whenever we decide to honor God through our giving, we acknowledge his ownership of our resources. Proverbs 3, 9, and again, looked at that this morning. The Bible said we honor the Lord. We honor the Lord. Think about that now. In regards to you, think about worship. Worship is about honoring God. We honor the Lord with our substance and the first fruits, with the first fruits of our increase. This is what, this is what we do. God is so good and that God is so awesome that before God asks us for anything, he gives it to us first. I said, before God asks us for anything, and I mentioned this morning what the old folks said when I came along, but I guess y'all didn't grow up with the same old folk I grew up with, because the old folk I grew up with would say, before God gives you, asks for a dime, he'll give you a dollar. But, and this is how awesome God is, that before God requests anything from us, he gives it to us first. That's God. This helps boost our confidence uh, in God and knowing that God is the one, in fact, who's in control of everything. And then the second thing I will submit to you, uh, brothers and sisters and visiting friends, and, you know, giving encourages our trust in God. It's based upon how much do you trust him. You see, our giving not only acknowledges God's lordship uh, over our resources, uh, but it also increases our faith in him. And do you recognize that God always rewards those who will trust him? I, I say if you and I would just, would just trust him, uh, God rewards our trust. And that's why the Bible says in Proverbs 3, 5, the Bible said, trust in the Lord, lean not to thine own understanding, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall bring it to pass. Whatever you're dealing with, God will bring it to pass. But you got to learn to trust him. Y'all remember, yes, y'all are Bible scholars. You remember when Moses sent over the 12 spies over to spy out Canaan's land? The Bible tells us that he chose one person from each one of the 12 tribes. He sent them over. And y'all remember, when they came back, the Bible said there were 10 that had negative reports. There were two that trusted God. And we remember their names. You don't see the names of the 10 who came back. We don't remember them. But we remember the name of the two that trusted in God. Those who trust in God will be remembered. God rewards those who, who trust in him. The Bible gives us an example of trusting him. In Mark chapter 12, verse number 41, the Bible says, And Jesus, one day, he sat over against the treasury. Because, you see, giving was a little different then. Because in Jesus' day, the days of the Jews, they would have the offering box, if you will, up front. And then everybody would get up. And then they will walk and give what they gave in, in the box. But what we do today, we make it convenient. When you give, you don't have to get out of your seat. We bring the box to you. And the Bible said Jesus sat over against the treasury, and he beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And the Bible said, and many that were rich, they gave much. And the Bible said, then there came this old certain poor, poor widow, I went to God, I can just deal with her just for a quick moment. The Bible says she was a poor widow. Now, you got to understand, now, we think about widow today is not the same as back then. Because we think about a woman then, a woman then depended on her husband. He was the one, he was the breadwinner, if you will, of the family. And so, therefore, she stayed at home. And so, therefore, here this woman was, she was a widow, which meant her husband had died. And now she's alone. She's a poor widow. She's, a, she's, she's absent of her husband. He's died. And now, basically, she's living the best way she can. So Jesus says, and there came a certain poor widow, and the book says, and she threw in two mites, the smallest amount of a coin back then. And the Bible says it made, and to make a farthing, 
Interesting, interesting. And the Bible says, and he called unto his disciples. He told them, you fellows, y'all come here. And he said to them, verily I say unto you, looking at what's going on, he said that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast in the treasury. I can just imagine the confusion. They said, Lord, maybe you didn't see what just happened. These people, they cast in the rich, cast in much. This woman cast in the least of all of the offerings that were given. But then Jesus said, for they all, for, for all they did cast of their abundance. What do you mean? That means after everything was paid, they gave what they had from what was left over. Their abundance, this beyond their living, what they had over. You know the money you put in your savings? That's what they gave from. Not what they lived off of, what they saved. So Jesus said they gave from the abundance. He said, but this lady, but she of her want. Now, I mean the things that she need on a daily basis. Did cast in all that she had. The Bible said even all her living. She didn't cast in what she had left over. There was nothing left over. She gave what it was she was living off of. And I want you to understand this. So as they went back, can you imagine? They walked up, they put in their offering, and went back to their seat. Can you imagine? They were looking at what they put in. God was looking at what they took back with them. The offering to God. Remember now, this is, you know, we think about sometimes, that's why I say we cannot think about God paying as if it's like a bill. Businesses go into business in order to make money, and in order to make money, the customers have to pay. If the customers don't pay, it won't be long, they're not going to be in business. That's why we don't have any more Zares, Woolworths, Eckert's, Hot Now, Sambo's. Thank God that name is gone. That was racist. That, that was a racist, racist name. But, but, but all that is gone now. Because why? Because when you recognize the idea, it's based upon the idea of money coming in. If money doesn't come in, then there's no way they can stay in business. But that's not, that's not the way it is with God. God's heaven does not run on money. And we got to be mindful of that. God has never laid off any angels. God, heaven has never went into a recession. And gas has never been $5 a gallon in heaven. Man counts what he gave, but God counts what do we keep. How much do you trust him? Our trust involves our gratitude for God. Melchizedek, and make sure I get this right. If not, Sister C. Wright going to see me at the class, at the church today. But she helped me, though. I do appreciate that. Melchizedek gave out of a gratitude. And, and Abraham then gave a tenth. And that's why I got that. I twisted it around. Because when, when Abraham came from the slaughter of kings, that's where it's mentioned in Hebrews 7, verse number 1, it's the slaughter of kings. And when he came from that, killed off those kings, brought back the spoils, the Bible says that Melchizedek goes out with bread and wine. He gives that, if you will, to Abraham. Then Abraham, in turn, from the spoils, he gives a tenth to Melchizedek. He gives a tenth. And so we go back and we talk about that. Whenever we talk about the tithe, giving to God, we go back to the law of first mention. Whenever there's tension in the text, we go back to the law of first mention. When was it first mentioned to understand the intent of it? What was the intent? Why was the tenth given? It was given out of gratitude. Because when you read Hebrews chapter 7, you recognize that Abraham felt that Melchizedek was someone who was greater than himself. And so we give, we are giving recognizing that God is greater than ourselves. Genesis chapter 14, verse 18 through 20, we see the story where Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. He blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abraham, the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemy into your hand. And the Bible said, then at that point, that's where I kept going and got and, and, and twisted around. And, and Abraham gave Melchizedek 
contents of all of the spoil that he had. And so we recognize that that initial first mention, it was the art, it was the act of gratitude. Uh, giving helps us to break free of our fear concerning our resources and solely look to God for gratitude for his provisions. And this is what we need to be mindful of. Those Levites were instructed, you remember, in the book of Malachi 3 and verse number 10, he said, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. And I want you to watch this now because I had to take time on this this week. He said, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. And then God says something very strange. Brother C. Right, this is very unusual. God says, prove me. That phrase literally means God is saying that from a Hebrew word, bakan, B-A-C-H-A-N. That means God is saying, test me. Now, 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 now notice this now. God, the creator, is talking to his creation. Man, anthropos, is being told to talk to the one who is the almighty and have him to prove something to you. Why was that strange? Because when I read my Bible, I had to jot this down. In Psalm 11, 5, the Lord says, it's God who tests the righteous. God is the one who examines the righteous. In Job 23 and verse number 10, Job says, when God has tried me, I will come forth as pure gold. Jeremiah 17 and verse number 10, Jeremiah said, the Lord mentioned through him to his people, I, the Lord, search the heart and I test the mind. The only other instance we find this Hebrew word in the Old Testament, B-A-C-H-A-N, B -A -C -H -A -N, it is always the idea of God examining us, God testing us. But we find here that God is telling man to test me. Why is that so interesting? Because in Psalm 95, 9, those who tested God were considered arrogant and sinful. Malachi 3, 15, arrogant, sinful. Whenever man takes upon himself to test God, they will consider arrogant and sinful. But here, the only place in the whole Bible, God tells man to test me. I thought that was so powerful to me. I don't know about y'all, but that was powerful to me. It took up a whole day. It took up my whole day just, just examining, looking at this. It was, so, it was so interesting. God says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Then you may have meat in my house and prove me now wherewith the Lord God. And God says, prove me. See whether or not I'll do what I say. See whether or not I'm a God of my word. That if you just do what I told you to do, I will open up a window. I will open up to you the windows, plural. Not, not, not just one, plural. I will open to you the windows of heaven. In other words, there will be so many blessings I will send your way. If you just do what I told you to do, God says, what's coming out of heaven? I'm pouring out a blessing, and you won't even have room enough. You won't even have room enough to receive what it is I want to give you. God said, no, not, now you, you, you try me and see whether or not I'm telling you the truth. Now, I don't have time to deal with all of this, but God here, in regards to speaking to the Levites, what had happened, you recognize that the Levites, because of their, their duty to the sanctuary, the Levites did not go out and do those manual jobs. So therefore, the other tribes were commanded to give a tenth of everything they had. They had to tithe. They had to give a tenth of everything to the Levites. The Levites had a responsibility of taking care of those religious matters. Um, whether it's the tabernacle, those things of the tabernacle, some need to be replaced. That was their responsibility. The setting up of the tabernacle, the, te the breaking down of the tabernacle, everything pertaining to that, that was the Levites. Now, so the people, the tribes, they gave 10% to the Levites. Now, when the Levites got the 
Their job, remember now, all priests were Levites, but all Levites were not priests. And so when the Levites got the ten, the tenth from all the other tribes, they were required, therefore, to give of the tenth to the priests. They had received it from the other tribes, but they didn't give it. They didn't give their tenth to the priests. And that's why you see this rebuke here where the Bible says now God is speaking through Malachi to the people. He said, you bring those tithes. You bring the tithes uh, into the storehouse, and there may be meat in mine in my house, and then I want you all to prove me, which is so fascinating that God allows man when it comes down to giving um, to test him. Only time God allows us that. And then I got to hurry. Um, giving, we mentioned by this, frees us from the love of money. First Timothy 16, the Bible says, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which why some covered after they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many, with many sorrows. Drop down to verse number 17, Paul said, charge them that are rich, those who have money. Charge them, all right? Uh, those individuals, they, they're not high-minded. And he said, and don't trust in uncertain, uncertain riches, but, but your trust ought to be in the living God. Because it's only God who giveth us richly all things for our enjoyment. Isn't that amazing? God gives us things so that we can, that we can enjoy. And the Bible constantly reminds us about the, the love of money. And so one effective way, my friend, is releasing um, that from, uh, releasing us from the bondage of the love of money. And the way we do that is by giving. We're, we ought to be good stewards. And my friend, and we ought to be the one controlling what God is giving us and not our money controlling us. And then number four, Giving advances the kingdom. Giving advances the church of Christ. Well, this should be um, the heartbeat of giving for every Christian. Our giving is a form of partnership. Where we partner with God in respect to the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the same thing that Paul mentions. When we sponsor the gospel of Christ, brothers and sisters, we are fulfilling the will of God concerning his kingdom. Financial resources are important tools in advancing the kingdom, which is the church. And through our financial sponsorship, as we, as we are giving on a weekly basis, the Lord's church is better, able to proclaim the gospel, not only here at Hilltop, but also in other locations um, as well. It was the Apostle Paul who praised the Church of Christ in Philippi for supporting him, uh, enabling him to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's a long past, Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. Paul said, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at your last your care of me it hath flourished. Where he also were careful, he said, you wanted to give me, but you didn't have an opportunity. Let me hurry. He says, not that I speak in respect of needing anything, because Paul said, I've learned that as I do the work of God, I've learned that whatever state I'm in, I've learned to be content. Paul said, I'm just going to use what I have. Paul said, because I know, I've learned how to abound. I know how to be a base. I know how to abound everywhere in all things I've instructed. He said, both to be full, and I can operate, and I also learn how to be hungry. He said, both to abound and also to suffer need. Because he said, you got to recognize, the one I'm doing this for, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. What are you talking about? Whether I'm hungry, whether my belly is full, I can do what Christ has commissioned me to do if it's going to make me stronger. I can do that. But then he praises them. He said, notwithstanding, you all have done so well that you did communicate. That word communicating is not talking about talking. That's talking about giving. He said that you did give with my affliction. He said, now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I first went out on my missionary journeys, when I departed from Macedonia, he said, no congregation gave me anything concerning giving and receiving. He said, but you all down in Philippi, you all were the only ones who did this. He said, even in Thessalonica, he said, y'all sent to me, not, not once, but then y'all gave me one love offering. Then, then you gave me another. And you did this for my, for my necessity. Not because, he said, listen, not because I desire um, a gift from you all. He said, but I desire. My thing is, I desire that you all receive fruit that God is going to put this on your account. And the thing that I'm rejoicing is about it because of what you all have done, the giving that you all have done, God is going to put this on your account. And then, and he says to them, but I have, and 
He said, I have all and abound. I'm full and have received of Aphrodite, the thing which you all sent me. He said, an odor. This, this offering was an odor, sweet. He said, smell. It was a sacrifice. It was acceptable. And it was an offering that y'all gave me that was well-pleasing, well-pleasing to God. He said, but I want you to know this. Thank God that y'all gave in furtherance of the gospel, helping me as a gospel preacher in regards to doing his will. But I want y'all to know when you all do what God has commanded you all to do, there's a blessing in this for you all as well. What's the blessing? But my God shall supply all your needs according to his will, according to the riches and glory by Christ Jesus. How will God do it? According to his riches. God will bless you according to his, y'all not getting this, y'all not getting this. According to his riches. We pay things and we base our bills on things according to our ability. When you're going down there, you want a car, you're going to sign on that dotted line. You got to look how much you got to pay down and how much you got to pay a month. Because it's all based on your ability. If I go out to eat and me and Sister Pound, we see Brother Seawright, Sister Seawright, we're going to go over there where they are because we're going to look for a free meal. Let me stop. But anyway, but, 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 but he pays based on his ability. Are y'all still with me? We pay on our ability. And so what Paul said is so powerful to me, he said because God is going to supply our needs based upon his ability according to those riches that he has in glory. And he's going to do this by way of Jesus Christ. I got to hurry. I got to hurry because some of y'all, some of y'all already finished the sermon. Some of y'all reached a conclusion before I got there. If giving open doors a blessing and an opportunity for us to express God's love. I don't have time. Acts 20, 35 with Jesus. Um, Paul mentions Jesus. We say it's more blessed to give than to receive. Giving proves our love for the Lord. It's a sure way of God's blessing to flow in our lives. My friend, in order to get, you must first give. We love getting, but God is trying to help us understand, if you want, my friend, if you want to receive something, you must first give something. Quickly, and I'm, and I'm, 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 I'm almost done. But pounds, how should I give to God? One important way we should give to God is sacrificially. Give to God sacrificially. We covered this. Give him sacrifice. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, it talks about the idea of a sacrificing. You got to sacrifice. We, we talk about the idea, that word shall, how powerful that word shall is. Shall denotes both a command and a promise. And God promises. Number two, giving should be done cheerfully and, and not out of compulsion. All right? Giving should be done cheerfully and not out of compulsion. It ought to be done with a cheerful heart. 2 Corinthians 9, verse number 7 where the Bible says every man, that's everybody, offering is to be done just like everybody who is a Christian, everybody ought to commune, everybody ought to give. Just like everybody ought to sing, everybody ought to be praying, everybody ought to either be the word be preached or everybody listening to the word, taking in the word. Worship is not a spectator sport. We are active in worship. And so the Bible says every man, according to he has intended purpose in his heart, so give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, but God loved a cheerful giver. So we give, we give, we're cheerfully giving to God, recognizing that this is a blessing. And then finally, another important way we should give to God is out of love for him. If nothing else, I ought to give to God because how much I love him. And oh, he's a mighty good God to us. Man, when David say we are fearfully and wondrously made, well, look how good God is to us. Even when we do things to hurt ourselves, God is so good. Can, can I tell you? You know, you could cut your finger. And boy, you could cut your finger and that blood comes out. Boy, I mean, boy, it's amazing how God made us. Because when God, when you cut your finger, what you see, that red comes out, that's those red blood cells. And boy, then they send a text message to the white blood cells and tell them, y'all need to hurry up and get on over here. And those white blood cells, then they show up. When the white blood cells show up, they'll take the place of the red blood cells. And then you begin to see that pus. Those are the dead white cells. The white cells will die just to keep you alive. 
They die. That's why you see the pus. And then what happens? After a while, my friend, it's amazing through a process, after the pus comes, then the body has enough sense to recognize healing needs to take place. And then a scab will grow over that just to protect you from infection. I'm trying to tell you how good God is. That scab grows over to protect us. And after the scab falls off, now you healed. And you're free to go cut yourself. Let me stop. But you, you, you're free. Hopefully you won't cut yourself anymore. But what I'm just saying, look how awesome. God, even the smallest, minute things, God already had them in his mind. And they're already taken care of. That's how awesome. God is. And I say, and we just ought to love him, church. You just, you just ought, to, ought to love him because God blesses us with blessings. I mean, just undeserved blessings. I don't know about you, but every now and then, you ought to just think about your life and just recognize that, God, I didn't deserve that. But, Lord, I just thank you. Thank you, Lord. I, I'm just so unworthy. I'm not even worthy to be called your child, but you love me anyway. Lord, I just want to take time just to say thank you. I know, Lord, I was getting ready to pray. There's some things on my mind I wanted to ask you for. But, Lord, you know, you've been so good, I'm not going to ask you for anything. I just want to just stop this prayer right now, Lord, and just say thank you. Just, just say thank you, Lord. Thank you. Because I recognize a couple of things. Number one, Lord, I'm only thanking you for what I know. There are so many blessings you have blessed me with that I don't even know. Can I tell you all something? God bless you even before you got here. Ah, let me, I'm, I'm going to leave this alone. I'll come back to another day. But let me just, let me, let me just say, let me tell you this. God blessed us even before, I said even before we arrived on the scene, God had blessed us. You know how I know that? I was looking at something not long ago. Y'all remember, yes, y'all Bible scholars, and I'm, I'm, I'm through. Remember Cain and Abel? Cain and Abel had some boys. They had a boy, y'all remember, um, Adam and Eve, I'm sorry, Adam and Eve had sons, Cain and Abel. Y'all still with me? <laughs> Adam and Eve had two boys initially, had Seth later. And, and, and the Bible said, y'all remember how Cain got mad with his brother, Abel? The Bible says, when you go back and study that, when the Bible said the way he killed him, he butchered him. He literally cut up his brother as if he was going to put him on the altar for a sacrifice. Y'all remember how God came and he asked Cain, where's your brother? And he said, well, am I my brother's keeper? And then God had to tell him, God says, your brother's blood. And you know, when you study that, your brother's blood cries to me from the ground. Blood is plural. Which meant when Cain killed Abel, he killed off all of the descendants of Abel. Y'all still not with me? Y'all still not with me? Your great, 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 great grandfather, if he didn't live, you wouldn't be here. My father... There was nine of us. One sister died. There was a twin died before I, I came on the scene. So with my mom, my father would have had, if you will, look at that, 10 children, 10 children. If my daddy had died as a teenager, I would have never been here. Because the blood, that's how powerful. That's why a murderer, a murderer, why his act is so evil. You are just looking, a person who kills another person, maybe they got mad with them, maybe something happened. You are not just killing them. You are killing the generation. And I don't, this is not black history. That's why black on black crime is so bad. We are killing off one another. Not just now. I'm talking about we are killing off future generations. The blood, God said, it cries to me. All these generations now that will never be born, all because of your one act and the way you looked at your own brother. I got to let you go. We should give to God out of love for him. Love God, love God, love God. Love 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7 and verse number 8. Therefore, as you abound in everything in faith, utterance, knowledge, and all temperance, that your love to us, that you abound in the grace of giving also. 
Paul says, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others to prove the sincerity of your love. You ought, we ought to love God by this grace of giving. We ought to love God. Giving is an important principle because this is God's way. God says, I want to bless you. I set this up to bless you as, as I close. Giving starts with God, and it must always end with God. Giving starts with God because everything belongs to God. In our text we looked at this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 7, the Bible says that he that soweth, and we talk about this, in order to sow, you got to have seed. The seed comes from God. And God wants us to take that seed that he gives us and put it in a ground that belongs to him. Put that which I give you into that which belongs to me, and then I will bless you. Because if you take what I give you, put it in what is mine, then what comes up, I will use that to bless you. But the key is you can't stop the process. I'll show you a poor farmer, one who has a barn full of seed and who's dying of hunger. This is what we're doing spiritually. We're not careful. We're not giving to God. He provides us with the seed. But if we don't plant the seed, if we don't sow the seed, then that seed would do us do us no good. God bless you today. Maybe there's somebody here today and you're, you're not a Christian. You're not a child of God. You're not, you're not a child of this good God. And I mean, he's a mighty good God. I mean, he is a, he's a good God. And, and you know God has been good to you. Whether you're his child or not, you know, you know God has been good to you. And I'm just saying to you because you recognize how good God is to you that don't you think it's time now for you to be good to him? How can I be good to God, Brother Pounds? you got to obey him. Being good to God is based upon man coming to the realization that I need to obey him. Because you can never be good to God if you don't obey him. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews 5 that many, the Bible tells us that, that Jesus became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. you got to obey him. Hebrews 5 verse 8 and verse number 9. you got to obey him. You obey him, then he becomes your Lord. Obey him, he becomes your savior. Obey him, he becomes your Christ. How can I do that, Brother Pounds? The, the, because you, I agree, he's, he's been good to me. He, he's watched over me, watched over my children. I don't belong to him. I, you know, I, I rarely come to church, and I don't, I don't read my Bible. I don't pray, uh, but I got you. But God is still good to you. And I'm saying to you today, today is the day you ought to make up your mind to be good to the one who's been good to you. So you come through obedience, having heard how Jesus was sent here, my friend, to die, to be buried, and to rise again the third day. That's the gospel. Paul calls it that. Having heard that, won't you believe that with all of your heart, repent of your sin, confess faith in the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and then be baptized in water for the remission, the removal, the cancellation of all of your sins. Live faithful unto death, and the Lord promised he'll give you a crown of life that won't fade away. If you remember the body of Christ and you're going astray, you come on back home to a process of repentance confession and prayer, or if you need prayer, Lord knows all of us do. All of us can fall on our knees and say, Lord, Lord, if it ain't one thing, it's another. Uh, I say, Lord, if it ain't one thing, if it's another. If it, is, if it ain't one thing nailed down, something else coming loose. And Lord, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. I'm standing in the need of prayer. And so therefore, if you need the Lord today, if you need the Lord, come on right now, we're going to stand. We'll seek a psalm of encouragement. Come on. Come from the lonesome way of sin, we'll hide in the blood.